Dobar dan svima. Gledam koga više zanima izveštaj o finansijskoj stabilnosti, da li javnost ili nas koji radimo na stabilnosti. Poštovana gospoda novinari. Dear members of the press, representatives of all the media, dear colleagues, Welcome to the presentation of the annual Financial Stability Report for 2017. Before I go into detail, I would like to remind you that the National Bank of Serbia uh, aiming to inform the public about uh, its decisions, the results uh, produced by these decisions has incorporated in uh, informing the public in addition to regular, that is the quarterly inflation report and press conferences that are rare but are thematic. So we have actually decided to include um, into this practice the presentation of the annual financial stability report as one of the key elements by which we aim to ensure a predictable and safe environment for doing business. To present this report uh, in the way you will be able to see, uh, so uh, those uh, who should be credited uh, for it are Ms. Diana Dragutinovic, Vice Governor, uh, then um, Vladimir Petrovic from Financial Stability, Darko Kovacevic, Mario Kovacevic, and Željko Jović, Vice Governor, is here as well. So we are here to support them in the work of uh, our colleagues. For the very introduction, I would like to utter a significant sentence. At the times when um, things happen very quickly, we all need uh, uh, predictability and stability, and this is the absurdity of nowadays. Uh, but what distinguishes uh, a civilization of, uh, from um, barbarianism is uh, an indispensable uh, stability and uh, safety so as uh, to develop uh, your own society, to develop your own um, capabilities and uh, to uh, leave a mark in this civilization. Those uh, who care um, uh, about uh, tomorrow every day in terms of uh, their work uh, values of the money they have in their um, wallets, uh, such persons uh, cannot develop uh, their own capabilities nor uh, can they uh, make uh, long-term plans. Uh, so this is the purpose of what we call the stability of the financial system, the purpose of a frequent uh, repeating of the word stability. Uh, so we will present to you a last year that was marked by positive developments, not only in Serbia, but in the international environment as well. And we have preserved financial stability. We have also strengthened it uh, significantly, which is reflected in a financial system that is to a large degree resilient to any potential uh, negative um, impacts um, in future. Um, so uh, last year we saw acceleration in um, global economic growth and this uh, reflected on, uh, uh, positively on the growth prospects of Central Eastern and Southeastern European countries and pushed the risk premium down. On the other hand, risks in the international commodity and financial markets persisted primarily those associated with volatile movements in global oil prices and divergent monetary policies of the ECB and the Fed as the two most influential monetary forces. Thanks to improved uh, structural characteristics and favorable growth uh, prospects, coupled with the enactment of well-timed measures and regulations, and full coordination between monetary and fiscal policies, Serbia is now more resilient to potentially adverse effects from the international environment. This was confirmed in 2017 by credit rating uh, upgrades by all three rating agencies, successful completion of the three-year standby arrangement with the IMF, and 
a decline in the country risk premium to its historic low. The National Bank of Serbia remained cautious in the conduct of monetary policy in 2017 due to uncertainties in the international financial and commodity markets. As inflationary pressures were running low, the key policy rate was cut twice uh, by 0.25 percentage points, uh, feeding through into lower costs of borrowing for the government, corporate and household sectors. More favorable interest rates are one of the key drivers of credit growth, which means that by easing its monetary policy, the National Bank of Serbia encouraged the increase in investment and private consumption and supported sustainable economic growth. In 2017, uh, the National Bank of Serbia achieved its key objectives, namely it ensured monetary and financial stability. Uh, throughout the year, inflation in Serbia was low and stable, moving within the new target band, which was lowered from uh, 4 plus minus 1.5 percent to 3 plus minus 1.5 percent as of early 2017. The fact that inflation stood at the 3 percent target in December only confirms that a decision to lower the inflation target was correct. At the same time, inflation expectations of the financial and corporate sectors have been anchored within the target band for quite some time already, indicating confidence in the National Bank of Serbia's monetary policy. Owing to better export performance, high FDI inflows and greater interest of foreign investors in long-term government securities, the DINA strengthened vis-à-vis -vis the euro, by 4.2% in 2017. The central bank's interventions in the foreign exchange market aimed at preventing excessive appreciation of the dinar provided an additional boost to the country's foreign exchange reserves, whose level, judging by all relevant indicators, is more than adequate. Last year was also very successful in terms of fiscal policy results. For the first time since 2005, a fiscal surplus was recorded, around 1.2% of GDP, while the share of public debt in GDP was slashed by more than 10 percentage points in 2017 alone. NBS's monetary policy easing, better positioning of uh, the country in the international financial market, stronger investor confidence, credit rating upgrades and a sharp fall in the country risk premium ensure cheaper sources of funding and reinforce Serbia's fiscal position. Against the backdrop of GDP recovery, low and stable inflation, a relatively stable exchange rate and vigorous fiscal consolidation Positive tendencies were recorded both in the corporate and household sectors. A fall in the unemployment rate and rising wages were accompanied with growth in household loans and rising savings. The volume of new household loans increased by 21.7% compared to 2016, with almost 71% concerning dinar loans which reflects households' confidence in the domestic currency. Households were also offered a new form of safe investment after the Republic of Serbia issued a new financial instrument, savings bonds. The issuance of savings bonds enables citizens to invest in the safest financing instruments and encourages further development of the government securities market. The financial position of corporates improved, as reflected in their almost two and a half times higher positive net financial result compared to 2016. In addition, the lowering of interest rates led to acceleration of credit activity in the corporate sector. Excluding the exchange rate effect, total corporate loans, both domestic and foreign, went up by 5.7% in 2017. 
Despite considerable cleanups of bank balance sheets owing to NPL write-offs, assignment and restructuring. The Serbian financial sector remained stable in 2017 as well, as signaled by all key indicators. Given the bank-centric nature of the financial sector, banks' financial soundness and ability to perform their main financial inter intermediation function is key to maintaining financial stability. Banks operating in Serbia rely predominantly on domestic stable sources of funding, which reduces their exposure to risks from the international environment. The banking sector remained adequately capitalized, highly liquid and profitable in 2017. Our quarterly macroprudential stress tests showed that the domestic banking sector as a whole would remain resilient to shocks, even if the worst case scenario materialized. I wish to particularly highlight the exceptional results achieved in reducing NPLs owing to measures undertaken in the context of the NPL resolution strategy and other regulatory measures of the National Bank of Serbia. After the National Bank of Serbia passed the decision on the accounting write-off of bank balance sheet assets in August 2017, gross NPLs worth 100 billion Dinars were written off in 2017, much more than in the earlier years, while 24.5 billion dinars were assigned to non-banking sector entities. The NPL share in total loans declined sharply by almost 14 percentage points from the start of implementation of the strategy. In May 2018, this share stood at 8.6%, meaning that NPLs fell below their pre-crisis level. Such as according uh, to latest data, uh, this figure stands at 7.8%, with the expectations that these data will um, become official, um, given the uh, already carried out uh, assignments mm -hmm. uh, in July. So this uh, level of NPLs uh, will be lowered by one percentage points in Serbia. Such a significant reduction in NPLs is indicative of considerable efforts invested in their resolution and the success achieved. It also reflects the great commitment of the National Bank of Serbia government and market participants. At the same time, this further supports future credit and economic activity. In 2017, the National Bank of Serbia also adopted a set of regulations transposing the International Financial Reporting Standard 9. These regulations reflect the National Bank of Serbia's commitment to encouraging adequate implementation of international standards, increasing the transparency of financial reports in terms of the manner of valuation of balance sheet items, and strengthening confidence in the bank's financial position. By regulating the banking area in the way it is done in the European Union and upgrading the regulatory framework, the National Bank of Serbia strengthened further the already high resilience of the banking sector. In accordance with the strategy for implementation of Basel III standards in the Republic of Serbia, in the December 2016, a set of regulations were adopted in effect as of the, th as of the 30th of June 2017. Among other things, Basel III standards introduce new capital buffers, which are some of the most important macroprudential policy tools. This helps increase the quality of capital and improve the resilience of the domestic banking sector to systemic risks, contributing to the preservation and strengthening of financial stability in the Republic of Serbia. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the press and dear colleagues, 
Behind us is a very successful year, as we can see in the results achieved, as well as in attained and improved macroeconomic stability. As so far, the National Bank of Serbia will remain committed to achieving its objectives, contributing to the resilience and stability of the domestic financial system. And I expect, as so far, that you should not trust what we say, but you should trust our results. I now pass the floor to my colleague, Vice Governor Diana Dragutinovic. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the press and dear colleagues, thank you all for being here today with us. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to have been given the opportunity to take part in the presentation of the latest financial stability report. I hope you won't mind if I describe it as a comprehensive, well-documented, clearly written, and most importantly, balanced report, as it gives a true overview of developments, trends, and risks that might occur if some trends continue. Let me start off with good news and positive developments. The Serbian economy is growing and is not alone in this, since the world economy is growing too, as well as the European. We still can't say that the growth is dynamic, but it sure is sustainable because it takes place in the face of deleveraging. That is significant reduction in both public and external debt. The three-year upward trend of the Serbian economy has translated into considerably higher total profitability of the corporate sector. Since 2015, when we started recording positive results, positive growth, net profit increased from 67.2 billion to 437.2 billion dinars in 2017. A rise in profitability, that is results, uh, look even more impressive, taking into account the fact that Companies operated at a net loss of 132.6 billion in 2014. Positive movements were registered in the labor market also, as well as in, in the domain of public finance. The number of economic entities under bankruptcy and liquidation procedures went down, and NPLs went down as well. Existing NBLs are being restructured, written off, or sold at an accelerated pace. As a result, the share of NPLs in total loans is lower than pre-crisis. What's also very important, neither corporates nor households are over-indebted. Corporate debt stands at 45% of GDP. Household debt is below 20% of GDP. The situation is far better than at a global level, where private sector debt, that is uh, corporates and households, makes up around 145% of GDP compared to 65% of GDP in Serbia. And the lesser the, the debt of the private sector, the smaller the risk that imbalances in the credit market will amplify the fallout from macroeconomic shocks and jeopardize financial stability. Despite positive developments, we must not disregard the fact that the indicators signaling risks to financial stability, for instance, the number of new bankruptcies or the number of new MPLs, are essentially a result of economic agents' behavior in the past. This is a very important indicator because it is a sure sign that there are certain problems in a certain part of the corporate and household sector. However, there is a certain time lag between the point that operational problems begin and the point when they manifest in the non-performance of obligations or higher number uh, of bankruptcy procedures. For assessing the financial stability at this point, what's very important are future developments because that is what shapes our current behavior and affects future MPLs and future bankruptcies. What can we say about the expected future developments? According 
to the uh, latest IMF's projections, the Serbian economy will grow in 2018 and 2019 uh, at a rate of 3.5%. The accelerated economic growth amid historically lowest interest rates will uh, translate into uh, higher uh, accelerated credit activity. In this concept, takes the National Bank of Serbia responsible for regularly assessing the sustainability of public and private debt in order to prevent the buildup of debt and minimize the risk that borrowers will not be able to amortize their loans by its regulatory activity. We can proudly say that the new international regulatory architecture built is fully transposed in the domestic regulatory framework. An important dimension of the new architecture is a significantly larger number of regulatory rules or limitations for the banking sector. In addition to capital standards, regulatory rules concerning liquidity, financial dependence, and loss absorption capacity were introduced. It is a fact that each regulatory limitation encourages banks to arbitration and rule dodging. However, multiple limitations requiring banks to hold sufficient capital at all times, eligible liabilities and liquidity in order to increase their resilience to potential economic and financial crisis minimizes this risk. The regulators focus on crises, even though they are not that common as they tend to occur once, every, uh, once in every 20 to 25 years, is a consequence of the high costs of the crisis. To assess these costs, there are two most frequently used approaches, the cumulative GDP loss relative to the long-term pre-crisis growth rate, that is the level that would remain if the, uh, if, uh, the economy continued to rise at that rate. The other method is the cumulative fiscal cost method. Admittedly, pre-crisis economic growth was unsustainable as it was based on excessive credit growth, that is, accumulation of both corporate, household, and banks' debt. According to all available estimates, the loss of GDP in the all largest world economy is uh, huge and long lasting because the GDP is 30 to 40 percent below the level it would have been had the economy been growing at a pre crisis rate. We get a similar picture by looking at the fiscal costs of the crisis, given that the change of the public debt before and after the crisis is somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of GDP. International reform of microprudential regulation focused on the four key areas, capital, financial dependence, liquidity, and recovery and resolution. The aim of the capital standards reform was to ensure that banks have sufficient quality capital to absorb unexpected losses and continue to extend loans in stressful conditions. Owing to capital standards, banks must assign granular risk weights to individual assets. As it is sometimes hard to assess risk weights, uh, a threshold for financial dependence was introduced, which, unlike capital standards, does not depend on internal risk assessment models and is, as such, less subject to arbitration. Solvency standards have been supplemented with liquidity standards. First, they bind a bank to have sufficient high-quality liquid assets to cover 30-day liquidity needs, leaving enough time to the regulator to potentially launch its resolution. Secondly, a bank's business model must be based on sustainable sources of funding, which is a defense against balance sheet expansion. Each expansion, therefore, must be supported by capital and stable sources of funding. It transpired during the crisis that the financial regulatory architecture lacked instruments which enable a control exit of financial institutions from the market. The directive, the, the recovery and resolution directive, uh, has bridged this back 
this gap and today we have such uh, tools such as a uh, uh, sale um, of a part of assets or liability uh, to another entity's transfer of shares of a bank undergoing resolution to another bank or for example bridge bank and also for the first time we have uh, another instrument which uh, enables uh, that creditors, not uh, only owners, are exposed to credit uh, losses, such as which is bailing tool. tool. In order to ensure that the costs uh, uh, of the crisis are paid by those who are responsible for the emergence of the problem and to avoid of uh, taxpayer uh, bearing the brunt of a crisis, minimum requirements for own funds and eligible li liabilities for bail-in were introduced. Microprudential standards were complemented with macroprudential measures, which are a powerful weapon in the struggle against excessive borrowing. The most important reforms concern two areas, macroprudential capital requirements and stress testing. Historically, capital standards have been static. However, as it was recognized that the risk in the financial system varies during a credit cycle, being the highest in the expansion phase and lowest in the contraction phase. In that sense, capital standards were set which require banks to hold more capital reserves during the credit expansion uh, phase. One of the key lessons learned during the crisis is that some institutions introduce a higher degree of risk to the system due to their size, complexity, and connectedness. This is why systemically important institutions must have additional capital buffers to mitigate the additional risk they introduced. Comprehensive macroprudential stress tests are carried out regularly at the NBS, which means on a quarterly basis. Their results are published in the annual financial stability report. Stress tests were implemented before the crisis as well, but were not comprehensive and macroprudential. The role of the stress test is to see whether banks have sufficient capital to weather unfavorable trends and to maintain critical functions during crisis. Stress tests, for the sake of caution, they are not based on banks' internal models which may underestimate risk. Instead, the regulator determines stress scenario assumptions, models the impact of the stress scenario on solvency and liquidity of banks, and the feedback effect on macroeconomic developments, and defines performance criteria. So the main uh, message of this report is that banks in Serbia are resilient enabled to maintain critical services even in turbulent, stressful times. They're able to do so because they operate at a profit, have a high level of capital for the risk they assume in their operations, and considerable liquidity reserves, and they're not indebted. Financial crises of the 1990s, especially in Scandinavian countries, taught us that stable public finance is of paramount importance for the stability of the overall financial system. Today we have sustainable public finance. The latest global financial crisis from 2008 highlighted the need for more stringent capital and liquidity standards and for using resolution as a crisis management method. Today we have these instruments at our disposal. Also, we learned from different crises that there is no perfect regulation and that every regulation changes by taking into account current conditions, particularly those that could, have, that could not have been envisaged. Trans let me conclude. The financial system is dynamic, and the challenge before the National Bank of Serbia, and not only the National Bank of Serbia, is to adjust regulatory rules so as to keep up with these developments. Thank you for your attention. I will now give the floor to the General Manager of the Financial Stability Department, Mr. Darko Kovacevic. Ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the press, dear colleagues, welcome to the presentation of the annual Financial Stability Report for 2017. Uh, 
In this presentation, we will uh, dwell uh, shortly on developments in the international and domestic environment, uh, present the key risks and the measures to mitigate them. As you know, traditionally, this report uh, covers and analyzes uh, the main segments of the financial system, such as uh, the domestic and international environment, uh, financial intermediaries, uh, that is, uh, the banking and non-banking sectors, financial infrastructure, and financial markets. Also, the report uh, presents uh, the results of uh, macro prudential uh, stress tests at the level of the banking sector uh, based on uh, 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 data for December 2017 and the end of the report is devoted to comprehensive assessment of financial stability and the quantification of uh, the degree of uh, systemic risk. Uh, the report uh, also uh, contains uh, several text uh, boxes uh, on uh, uh, topical issues uh, that have uh, uh, happened in 2017 in the domain of financial stability including uh, in early 2018. Uh, the report also presents uh, the key risk from the international environment as well as the measures to mitigate them. Uh, the acceleration of economic activity at a global level of both uh, advanced economies and emerging markets, uh, rising uh, oil prices, uh, the outcome of negotiations in terms of uh, uh, Brexit, uh, uh, mounting uh, geopolitical tensions and divergence of monetary policies of the ECB and the Fed on the, uh, on the uh, one hand, uh, that is... Divergence monetary policies of the ECB and the F, uh, uh, of, the F, of the Fed are the key factors from the international environment that marked the last year. The divergence of the Fed's monetary policy from policies of the leading central banks could affect uh, the increase in uncertainties in the international financial market and the capital flows uh, to emerging economies. Uh, given the high presence of banks with foreign capital in the domestic market, uh, developments in the euro area and movements in credit activity uh, could, uh, to an extent, affect uh, the financing of subsidiaries in Serbia. According to results uh, of the survey of the European Investment Bank about uh, credit activity of banks in the region of Central and Southeastern Europe, we saw uh, 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 a decline in the deleveraging risk in, uh, compared to 2015 and 2016 uh, due to facilitated access to domestic sources of financing, uh, most notably corporate and household uh, deposits. We still have the risks in the international commodity and financial markets in terms of uh, global oil uh, prices uh, that have uh, recovered uh, since mid-2017. After a period of exceptionally low interest rates of the leading central banks uh, in the medium uh, run, we may expect a period of their growth, which in the conditions of volatile uh, interest rates uh, can lead to an increase in the um, cost of borrowing and servicing of the current liabilities. Uh, one of uh, more important risks is the high level of euroization of the domestic financial system. Around 68% uh, of loans and deposits of the corporate and household sectors are um, FX denominated. Uh, given that the currency structure of uh, um, claims and uh, liabilities of banks are matched, uh, banks are not exposed to the FX risk, risk uh, to, to, to an extent. On the other hand, uh, many clients um, borrow in foreign currency and earn in the domestic currency, which is why these clients are exposed to the FX risks, and uh, in this way, banks are also exposed to the credit risk. Also, high degree of euroization weakens the transmission mechanism of uh, the monetary policy, uh, which is why the impact of the NBS key policy rate uh, uh, reflects only on a part of the domestic credit market. Uh, the second risk uh, that uh, um, was uh, talked a lot uh, about recently, and where we made a significant progress, uh, are NPLs. Uh, we should uh, emphasize that uh, NPLs are not a problem of the financial system itself, uh, but of the real sector as well, given that they may impact uh, credit activity and economic growth as well. As we have said, uh, the acceleration of economic activity at a global level, uncertainty uh, of movements in uh, primary uh, commodity prices, notably oil, divergent monetary policies of the leading central banks and geopolitical tensions are the key risks uh, from the international environment. The acceleration of euro area growth uh, affected positively the improvement uh, of um, uh, growth outlook of uh, countries of Central and Southeastern Europe, contributing uh, to a decline in the risk uh, premium of these countries and the recovery of financial markets. We should uh, highlight that the projections of economic growth of the euro uh, area uh, are marked by a high degree of uncertainty due to the Brexit and uh, the mounting uh, geopolitical tensions. Euro area inflation moved uh, below the 2% ta target at the end of the 
year, it stood at 1.4%. Responding to low inflationary pressures, the ECB continued uh, with its uh, quantita- quantitative easing program, but uh, to a reduced volume, emphasizing expectations that interest rates uh, of the ECB will remain low uh, in a protected uh, period of time. On the other hand, the Fed continued to normalize its monetary policy, in, uh, hiking its uh, rate three times in 2017, and in October it decided to start with the uh, normalization of its balance sheets that expanded significantly since 2008. Uh, If we compare the stability of the domestic uh, system compared to 2016, we may conclude that this stability has increased owing primarily to a decline in the public debt share in GDP as a result of a strong fiscal adjustment. The share of public debt in GDP at the end of 2017 equaled the 61.5% and was lower by as much as 10.4 percentage points uh, relative to to 2016. According to data of the Public Debt Administration, in early 2018, we saw a further decline in the public debt share in GDP uh, at the current level of uh, 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 59.7%. In terms of external imbalances, we saw a temporary rise in the current deficit that was fully covered by FDIs, which we expect to continue. For the first time since 2005, we have recorded a fiscal surplus of 1.2% of GDP. Uh, GDP increased uh, by 1.9% in 2017, uh, led primarily by growing investment and private consumption. In the coming period, we expect further acceleration of economic growth uh, to reach at least uh, 3.5% in 2018 and 2019 with the maintenance of a favorable growth structure. Low inflationary pressures were present in 2017 as well, and throughout the year, inflation was low and stable, moving within the target tolerance band. Uh, 2017 also saw relative stability of the exchange rate. Um, uh, In early last year, we saw depreciation pressures, uh, especially due to the tightening of monetary policy of the Fed and the seasonal demand of energy importers for FX, but these negative effects were uh, lessened by the timely response of the NBS. Since April 2017, we saw appreciation pressures owing to better export results, a high inflow of FDIs and increased um, foreign investor demand for government securities. In 2017, the DINA strengthened against the euro by 4.2% and the NBS was a net buyer of FX in the amount of 725 million euros, thus additionally reinforcing uh, the NBS FX reserves uh, that equaled 10 billion at the end of the year. Stable macroeconomic situation, a stable exchange rate and low inflation um, triggered a decline in the country's risk uh, premium to a historical low and an upgrade upgrade of credit rating by all three uh, rating agencies. In 2017, the key policy rate was cut twice uh, by total 0.5 percentage points to 3.5 percent. Beonia continued to move uh, below the um, key policy rate throughout the year. Owing to um, the effects of uh, monetary policy easing, uh, we saw a decline in corporate borrowing costs. At the end of the year, the average rate on new dinar loans equaled 4.7%, uh, down by 0.7 percentage points compared to 2016. In the same period, average uh, interest rates on new euro-indexed loans fell by 3.1% to 2.8% mainly due to a decline in the country's uh, country's risk premium and improved uh, outlook of the Serbian economy. A decline in dinar interest rates of the household sector results from the uh, monetary policy easing, but also reflects uh, uh, enhanced competition of banks in the credit market. Interest rates on new dinar loans fell by 0.3 percentage points to 10.6% in the same period. Rates on new euro-indexed loans fell by 0.15% percentage points to 4.2 percent. A decline in interest rates and more favorable market conditions can in the next period positively affect credit activity and thus economic growth as well. 
As a result of the NPL resolution strategy and other regulatory measures of the NBS, at 10 2017, gross NPLs made up 9.8% of total loans, which is by 7.2 percentage points lower compared to 2016. According to the latest data, this share is even lower and amounts to 7.8% which means that the NPLs fell below the pre-crisis level. In the future period, we expect a further uh, decline in NPLs. In terms of sectoral structure, the share of NPLs is uh, higher in the corporate than in the household sector. NPLs do not jeopardize financial stability, bearing in mind their level, and the fact that these loans, NPLs, are fully covered by regulatory reserves and accounting uh, allowances for impairments. The banking sector in 2017 recorded positive financial results and operated uh, at a profit, even more profitable compared to 2016, with the uh, return on capital 10.6%, uh, largely due to the one-off effects of consolidation of the banking sector and a decline in net credit losses. All the profitability indicators are positive. They are somewhat lower compared to the regional average, which stands at 12%. Also, the first half of 2018 indicates that the banking sector will be profitable this year as well. Domestic uh, corporate loans have uh, risen in real terms by 4.3%, uh, despite significant write-offs and assignments to uh, non-banking sector entities. Excluding those effects, domestic corporate loans would rise at 13% uh, year-on-year. They rose uh, in those terms. Credit risk of the corporate sector measured by the share of NPLs in 2017 stood at 10.4% and declined by 6.8 percentage points compared to 2016, owing to NPL resolution activities, as well as owing to the collection, write-off, and assignment of the part of these NPLs. Thanks to the recovery of the economic uh, activity, a lower cost of borrowing of the corporate sector and uh, maintain, achieve stability of the exchange rate, uh, companies uh, recorded excellent uh, business, uh, business results in 2017. All sectors operated with a profit, uh, especially mining and manufacturing. Also, for the first time since 2010, construction recorded positive uh, result which means that this sector has recovered and also that the real estate market recovered as well. Net financial result of the economy uh, amounted to 437 billion dinars, which is almost two and a half times high result compared to the one from 2016. Positive movements of the corporate sector reflected also on the labor market in terms of the higher number of employees, lower rate of employment and higher wages. Given that over 90% of the assets of the domestic financial system refers to the banking sector, movements in the banking sector are particularly important. Uh, capital adequacy ratio uh, at 22.6% in December 2017 is below the region's average. Above, above the region's average. Also, capital adequacy ratio is significantly higher uh, than the minimum uh, uh, pre re prescribed by the domestic regulations, which is 8%. In the structure of regulatory capital, around 95% are the highest quality core capital. In the banking sector assets, uh, credits uh, are still predominant category. They account for 62% of the assets, which means that the banks are traditionally uh, oriented to credit deposit activities. Uh, cash and balances with the central bank made up 14% of total assets, which means that the banking sector is highly liquid. Financial assets made up 90% of assets, and these mainly refer to the securities of the uh, government securities of the Republic of Serbia, which means that banks are prone uh, towards safer investment. Uh, speaking about the sources of funding, Bank in Serbia rely on domestic stable sources of funding. Total deposits at end 2017 uh, made up 70% of liabilities. Strengthening of the domestic deposit base uh, enables banks to reduce the dependence on their parent companies, which means that they are less exposed to risks coming from the international environment. Speaking about strength
stress test results, credit uh, risk is the uh, most, uh, is the predominant risk in our banking system, uh, and around 84% of total capital requirements uh, concern this risk. In order to assess the resilience of the banking system based on macroeconomic scenarios that are presented in this report, we have projected the NPL movements in the time uh, period of one year. According to a central projection, uh, we have projected a further growth, a further decline in NPLs, while the capital adequacy ratio from the starting 22.6 would rise to 23.9%. According to the modest scenario, capital adequacy ratio would stand at 21%, while according to the worst case scenario, this uh, indicator at the banking sector level would amount to 18.9%. This means that the capital adequacy ratio for the banking sector, even in case the most unfavorable um, scenario materializes, would remain significantly above the regulatory minimum. The liquidity risk is not uh, to that extent uh, pronounced as the credit risk. However, the developments from October 2008, when we saw the withdrawal of around 10% of deposit, indicate that it's also important to monitor this risk. The banking sector, even in the case of uh, worst case scenario, which assumes uh, twice, uh, double the shock uh, from October 2008, uh, would entail the withdrawal of around 21% of total deposits, but the sector would remain liquid. With the liquidity ratio of 1.24, uh, which means which is uh, significantly above the regulatory minimum. Stress tests uh, show that even in the worst case scenario, our banking sector would remain adequately capital capitalized and highly liquid. Uh, the insurance sector is stable with a high uh, capital adequacy and s excellent business results. This was confirmed also by the second round of stress tests conducted in 2017. Net result of insurance undertakings at 10 2017 uh, stood at 6.4 billion dinars with the return on assets of 2.8%. On the other hand, a modest share of 6.3% in the assets of financial sectors indicates that there is a large potential for the further development of this sector. The sector of voluntary pension funds continued to record positive results, which are reflected in the growth in their net assets of 10%, and the fund's return rate of 4.7%. Also, the financial leasing sector recorded positive results, which relate to the assets increase of 14%, uh, while the uh, NPLs were also reduced, and a positive business result was recorded of 670 million dinars. The period from January till December 2017 can be uh, characterized as a period of high stability with the exception of somewhat uh, increased level of stress in the capital market and the money market. Uh, continuing uh, the uh, seasonal depreciation pressures from the end of 2016 and the tightening of the Fed's monetary policy. The whole 2017 is marked by relatively stable exchange rate and a low and stable inflation. Improved uh, prospects of Serbian economy, uh, decrease in public debt and fiscal surplus contributed to the better macroeconomic performances of Serbia, which was recognized by international institutions and rating agencies. This led to the uh, decline in Serbia's uh, risk premium to its historical low and improvement in credit rating of the country by all three rating agencies. The domestic banking sector is highly cap capitalized, highly liquid, profitable, and with a share of NPL below the pre-crisis level. Also, the non-banking sector uh, recorded significant uh, business results, which altogether contributes to the low level of, syst uh, low level of uh, systemic stress indicator during 2017. Finally, uh, please, uh, we invite you to look at uh, the test box in the Annual Financial Stability Report, uh, where we cover some of the copy topical issues uh, from 2017 and early 2018. Our focus was on capital buffers. They are a novelty from Basel III standards, and they are um, applied since the June 2017, and we tried uh, to present them to the wider public uh, uh, in these uh, text boxes. We wanted to present uh, macro prudential policy tools both through these theoretical um, uh, presentations and also by presenting results of the stress tests that we conduct in the National Bank of Serbia. Uh, we are now finished 
finishing the presentation. Thank you for your attention. We are here uh, at your disposal for any of your questions, but please uh, do bear in mind the focus of today's presentation, which is the stability of the financial system. Financial system as a whole and systemic risk and not individual financial institutions. Thank you once again. Milica Rilak from uh, Radio Belgrade. Uh, last week, uh, with Mr. Uh, there was a talk with Mr. Sosa from the IMF. We heard that the IMF uh, recommended uh, that the NBS should upgrade uh, the denarization strategy. Mr. Sosa uh, used the words uh, upgrade and update. Uh, so are we to expect any novelties in this regard, that is the adoption of the new denarization strategy until the end of this year? And uh, are you working on this? And uh, what are uh, the possible novelties to be introduced? Uh, in September, we expect our colleagues, that is friends uh, from the IMF, and uh, we will talk uh, about uh, the topic that you mentioned as well. So after these talks, uh, we will be able to answer this question in more detail. Dragon Slav, RTS. Uh, what are your concerns? Uh, the current situation is not the same. So, what are the concerns uh, for the National Bank? Uh, what fears do you have? Are there any challenges in terms of the sale of a commodity on a bank or a capital increase? Uh, so around 20 million euros uh, are uh, lacking. Uh, so we have uh, always uh, had uh, volatility. Uh, so now this, that is 20, um, 200 billion euros. Uh, so now we have... Uh, a different situation, and uh, when it comes to the household sector, uh, but once we um, abolish the law on um, limitations of um, wage and pension increases, will there be any uh, progress in this regard uh, to the benefit of households and less to the benefit of banks? We don't have any fears. When I say fears, uh, we are not talking about uh, our um, characteristics, our traits. Uh, uh, we are responsible and uh, brave enough uh, to encourage e uh, credit growth, true economic growth, uh, without entering the trap of over indebtedness. We have sufficient mechanisms, uh, we have sufficient information as well, expertise, there is know how, and responsibility. Uh, to strike a balance among uh, these extremes um, in the way that we have been uh, striking a balance uh, all this time in terms uh, of having uh, one international accounting standard, um, the standard implying that this standard implying that we should match revenues and expenditures in such a way that you expect that revenues uh, are certain once they uh, have been credited to your account and you should have expenditures in mind even when they're not potential. So this caution was maintained uh, by the government and uh, uh, pursuing uh, this principle of uh, caution. Now we are talking about a surplus and improve the growth outlook of the Serbian economy and we can also apply this principle to uh, the financial stability that we have achieved. Uh, when it comes to um, credit uh, uh, indebtedness that encourages uh, consumption to the extent uh, that this does not mean uh, spending your future in advance. It means, in fact, uh, um, lending uh, meaning uh, to life and not depriving yourself for too, uh, too long a time. And uh, I believe that we have uh, stricken a balance uh, by harmonizing balances of the government, but... Uh, uh, we are all. We all have to harmonize these balances uh, uh, in terms of what we need to give up on uh, uh, to the benefit of uh, consumption, which means safety uh, for uh, worse times, 
And what means consumption? What is the consumption that will not jeopardize inflation and uh, stable and sustainable growth and which is uh, encouraging at the same time? I don't uh, uh, ask you to trust my words, but I want you to trust the, the data. We have uh, investment consumption of the government. We have an increase in imports, but of those goods that uh, serve uh, for investment consumption that should generate economic growth. And now I go back uh, to the main principle of uh, matching uh, revenues and expenditures and caution in defining them. All this uh, should be mutually harmonized, uh, both uh, time-wise uh, and it should be uh, mutually dependent as well. So all models, uh, no matter how, uh, uh, what, no matter, uh, how um, complex their name, may be, and uh, regardless of all the defin definitions, you should spend as much as you earn, you should save as much as your life does not lose a se sense, and uh, your future revenues, income, should be uh, taken into account in accordance with today's investment through loans either of the government or individuals. So there were those uh, uh, who did not have uh, sufficient information. I never doubted uh, their good intentions, but they were afraid of whether excessive uh, credit uh, debt of uh, individuals in terms of cash loans, for example, whether this debt was excessive. Uh, my colleague Diana... Uh, talked about uh, these levels. Uh, she talked about the comparisons uh, between Serbia and other countries in terms of household debt. So these figures are not uh, varying at all. Jeko can complement uh, my answer. Uh, but uh, we have uh, the, the reserves uh, for these uh, loans when it comes uh, to uh, longer terms. Uh, and these terms uh, are 5, 7 or even 12 years. And in terms of amounts, we cannot uh, call them uh, consumer loans uh, because uh, uh, they exceed the level of 5,000 euros, for example. So what is important here, and I'm really glad about this fact, a part of these loans that we call um, consumer cash loans um, are actually the loans taken by natural persons on behalf of the economic entities uh, for uh, uh, produ production and investment purposes, meaning that our courage and the lack of fear as well as uh, um, constant caution, uh, speak in favor of this, meaning that we examine all the facts in a structural way and in a lot of detail so as to make the real decisions and to reach um, right conclusions. And this report serves this purpose. We have to assure the public that we um, uh, examine financial system in the broadest sense. Uh, this time we are talking talking about banks because our system is bank-centric, but we also cover other financial uh, services, including the insurance sector as the first one here. And when we talk about Commercialna Bank, uh, the government uh, is not in this situation uh, to... Uh, It, it uh, cannot uh, accelerate any privatization of financial institutions, including of Commercialna Bank, and it has to consider all the aspects, uh, especially when it comes to Commercialna Bank, uh, where uh, the state has a significant share. The privatization process uh, will be, we are preparing for it, and uh, the NBS takes part in this process, and uh, some of the future co-owners, shareholders in Commercialna Bank can be only those who are um, acceptable investors in terms of financial strength, experience in managing financial institutions, and long-term commitment to contributing uh, to the already achieved strong position of the financial system in Serbia. So once again, there are no reasons for having fears. We are here, and if I miss to say anything, please say so. Uh, this is what I, uh, I told you this through one sentence. We are not asking the question whether an increase in wages and pensions 
uh, we are working on projections, but this will jeopardize our um, uh, main statutory objective of uh, maintaining, maintaining inflation within the uh, legally defined target. But we have to understand that the sustainability of economic growth must have this social component as well, meaning that people should uh, be motivated uh, to be rewarded for giving up on something, and they have uh, to see in a brighter light this better position of Serbia in the overall sense. Uh, but uh, in this regard, and when it comes to our decisions as well, we should not have any sudden moves. We have had uh, several uh, election cycles, and the government has not taken at any moment any irresponsible decision, and the NBS has not taken any irresponsible decision either. And given this, I, ha I believe that everybody should have confidence and uh, we have a relatively stable exchange rate. This is an, an important component when we talk about inflation, credit growth, and the overall indebtedness of the government uh, households uh, and the corporate sector. As of today, we have created a buffer amounting uh, to 1.4 uh, billion of a net purchased uh, foreign uh, currency in the um, um, in the um, interbank FX market. This means that we are prepared for all the challenges before us and all the criticism at our expense uh, and um, uh, at the expense of any um, lobbying groups or um, groups uh, in general uh, do not hold water. Uh, the other day, the director of the IMF said that Serbia is um, uh, a country can can be um, looked at as an example. What does it mean? What uh, does this message mean coming from the director of the IMF? To be frank, this was the least expected question uh, at this presentation after everything that we said. If there are not sufficient evidence in what we presented to you today, 570 uh, below, 570,000 uh, number is the uh, number of unemployed persons, the fiscal per surplus, uh, also the balanced account of the state, lower borrowing, lower costs of borrowing, lo uh, lower interest rates, 2 billion and 400 million of net FDIs in the last year, out of which majority are investments in new factories, meaning investment in production, and a lesser share of the portfolio investment of the necessary deficit financing. So this list can go on for a longer period. All these results have contributed to this. It would, we would sound uh, immodest, uh, but it is true that Serbia is one of the rare countries which, which have uh, turned the, some prejudices about the IMF into a partnership relation. We have, we have uh, gathered experience and knowledge, theoretical, and our, added our responsibility uh, for setting the program, shaping the program in such a way that would lead to uh, some uh, results which do not mean uh, finishing all your work, but uh, creating, for example, some significant uh, sustainability such as stable inflation, growth in dinner sa savings, which is not sufficient, but it's three times higher than before. So I would say, uh, uh, if you don't mind, that this uh, question uh, is actually uh, superfluous. superfluous. We are being uh, elaborate in our explanation of credit tracing, risk premium, etc. I will tell you, I'm proud when uh, talking to investments, I hear that Serbia is not part of the region in terms of investment. That they look at this part of the region uh, uh, there was a time before that we shared the sen destiny of other persons' politically motivated, responsible decisions in terms of investor investment. Today, they're not looking at Serbia with those same eyes. Uh, to Serbia, we are seeing the inflow of long-term, high-quality investment, both to production and to portfolio investment, where you do not have the policy of... Uh, 
invest, earn, and then uh, uh, go, go, go quickly. On the contrary, we are seeing high-quality investors who are oriented to Serbia for a longer term, who are very well acquainted with the situation here, but what's most important, they know that the Republic of Serbia and its authorities, including the National Bank of Serbia, have proven their independence and how they say we uh, earned our credibility by making decisions which are in the long term interests of Serbia. And we are for them somebody who uh, 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 is actually in charge of its own destiny. But at any point, we are not for them any kind of eccentrics who would uh, jeopardize economic stability at a, from any reasons. Political economic uh, stability, which I call coordination of monetary and fiscal policy, is something that distinguishes Serbia from many countries in the region. However, I will never say that we are... Uh, I will never compare us uh, with other countries and um, emphasize their faults, but there are many reasons, uh, many examples that confer this. Jelena Petrovic from M1. We have heard today that banking sector is profitable. On the other hand, we have this trend of introduction of uh, fees for some uh, banking services. So let's hear from you. The fees are rising. Uh, for example, the fees for uh, the, uh, disbursing the money from ATMs. Uh, until the uh, implementation of the law on, um, on fees for payment services. You have combined uh, two questions in your question, the issue of profitability and the issue of uh, raising certain fees until the application of the law on payment services. The, uh, the issue of profit will be explained by Jelko, but I can tell you immediately the growth in banks profit uh, does not concern the rise in prices because interest rates are falling. Every uh, loan beneficiary knows that. But this is uh, the increase in the coverage, both by loans, but on the other hand, also in the profit. You have a high share of income from payment transactions. That is a higher number of payments that was uh, in focus of our legislative activity. I will just tell you one thing. This is another situation where you have to strike a balance between two extremes. We must uh, say, set some rules for banks in order for them to be prepared for the application. And this is this list of 10 to 20 representative services, payment services, which they will be, uh, we will have to publish on their websites along with the prices in order for citizens to be able to choose between banks, uh, between competitive banks, and to find uh, uh, what's the most affordable for them. But uh, in this period, before the applications of these uh, 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 rules, but this, I will not call this vacuum, but this period, some banks have seen as an opportunity to increase some costs. And this is an opportunity for the citizens and for the media to assess the behavior of banks which are insufficiently aware that they cannot operate without clients. There will be some job for us too, but the majority of our job was done by requesting from banks to define those terms and not to do anything unilaterally. So the citizens must know what... Uh, what uh, increase, uh, increase in fees will be made. This is our contribution, but it seems like this is not sufficient. But I think that we must work more on this interdependence of banks and clients. And I would like to hear more about the terms that are offered to corporate clients, meaning companies and enterprises, because every citizen in the end can measure whether something is more or less expensive compared to his salary. And to the largest extent, uh, they receive those salaries in a company, larger, smaller, his own company. And there are uh, a small share of freelancers uh, with, uh, to, uh, who change companies and who are not to that uh, extent affected by the corporate uh, credit terms. So compared to the salary, you measure whether something is expensive or uh, cheap. So I would like for banks to work more on corporate clients, but I would like to ask 
uh, Željko to uh, speak more about this prejudice on uh, extensive profit of banks and to tell us what's the structure of this profit. Thank you. Uh, when we talk about the result um, of the finance of the banking sector for 2017 and the tendencies uh, in the first six months of this year are similar, the key determinants of income that we talk uh, often about in the media, such as uh, interest, uh, net interest income, uh, so this has not changed uh, significantly. We have the result of around uh, 69 billion for 2017, and we also have uh, net interest income that is 121 billion. And, in, and is lower than in 2016. The reason for the decline is a decline in margins. Uh, so this was led uh, by a decline in uh, lending and deposit interest rates. On the other hand, um, why uh, did this happen? Uh, so the decline in margins is much higher than the decline in income. Uh, maintaining income at the level of... Uh, at, at this level uh, was uh, um, uh, led uh, by the volume of credit activity. On the other hand, uh, we have a decline here. The second most important category in uh, terms of income are uh, net fees. Uh, they're at a level of around uh, 36, uh, 37. Uh, their contribution, that is uh, their increase in 2017, is around 2.5 billion. But unlike uh, those interpretations in the media, these are not uh, fees relating uh, to loans. Uh, these are fees uh, concerning uh, payment transactions at home and abroad and the use of uh, payment uh, cards. And this was caused, uh, you received uh, uh, information from the governor uh, about uh, the volume of increase in uh, cashless payments. Uh, so there is no such impact. Uh, the main difference in this result uh, compared uh, to 2016 results uh, from uh, two factors. One of factors, uh, meaning the m merging of some banks. And the second part uh, concerns uh, a decline in uh, net expenditure from impairments, uh, and they accompany, uh, they follow NPLs. With the reduction in NPLs, so the basis for the application has been reduced. Uh, by resolving uh, NPLs, uh, we also have uh, lower um, allowances for impairment. Uh, and the focus of the NBS in the coming period uh, uh, will be uh, to have uh, the uh, will be not to have have such effect of newly created uh, credit activity, the effect that will be visible through allowances for impairment. Uh, so why do we have an increase uh, uh, in uh, these fees uh, for banking services? For these reasons or not? Uh, so fees uh, increased. So we have two possible factors that may impact uh, these positions that you see in the income statement. Uh, one is the rate and the second is the volume. The dominant influence uh, comes from the volume of activity, not from the rates. And uh, if you have uh, unfavorable experiences at uh, this moment concerning the introduction of fees, we have uh, the Consumer Protection Center at the NBS. If you have a problem, uh, you can uh, send a complaint to the bank, and then after the bank responds, uh, you can address uh, the uh, Financial Consumer Center of our central bank, and we can see where the problem lies. So in the economy, we call this uh, the economy of scale. Uh, so uh, when we have a larger number of uh, instances, we have higher income. Uh, if you have any other ambiguities, uh, please uh, be free to express them. Uh, so uh, I believe that the problem relates uh, to terminology as well. What about the transparency? Uh, so uh, we didn't have a sufficient transparency in terms uh, of the names, in terms of um, uh, booking uh, some items, in terms of recording them. And we had to introduce uh, the list of products offered uh, by banks. Uh, they should not um, uh, resort to any creative language by introducing uh, new products and uh, calling uh, some services in a different way so as to charge for them. That's why we are talking about the effect of 
interest rate. So what is the real cost of something? And this is why I'm trying uh, uh, to uh, encourage my colleagues uh, to use the simplest language when communicating with the public. We should not hide anything. Uh, each profession has its own language as well. Uh, so the language of love, uh, the language of the mafia, of the lawyers, um, and of bankers as well. So this language actually tries to hide more than to, re than to reveal. So we are trying uh, to change this pattern. Uh, we wish uh, to have everything uh, presented and communicated uh, clearly. Uh, so this will be fashion uh, called... Uh, I mentioned uh, this uh, international standard. It will be called the macro, uh, macro, macro prudential framework, and uh, it will be uh, now called a uh, macro prudential uh, framework. This actually relates to elementary principles of reasonableness, of prudence. Uh, take into account the word uh, uh, prudential. This means when you're being reasonable, prudential. When you're prudential, it means that you're uh, practical as well. When you're wise, uh, you make a decision which is clever and uh, practical as well. So this practical aspect uh, means that you ask uh, from a bank uh, not to educate you and not to teach you about a new financial terms and the central bank must help in this domain, it should tell you, your loan will cost you uh, this amount of money when you sum up all the costs that we envisage in in terms of loan disbursement, you will have to pay this price. The manner in which it will be expressed and calculated should be clear to you at the, mon at the moment of taking the loan. You are working on this. And uh, banks are always one step uh, ahead of us, but we will try uh, to uh, catch uh, up with them and to stop this uh, practice. Uh, for example, if you have a milk chocolate of uh, 100 grams and uh, it is sold uh, at the same price, uh, whereas its uh, um, ma mass has been uh, reduced. Uh, so uh, this, sh this analogy should be uh, hampered and uh, uh, we openly announce our measures. Uh, uh, we sh uh, the aim is not to have some entities uh, uh, fool anybody else. So when you open a loan, when you uh, open your card, you should be sufficiently uh, clearly informed about what awaits you tomorrow. So this is the predictability and certainty that we are talking about. Uh, we have had uh, cases and we are working on this. When a bank uh, gives a loan and you have um, a current account with that bank and they say we will give you the loan but you have to open another account uh, to which this loan will be paid so that they uh, can charge uh, maintenance costs uh, in uh, respect of this account. This is not a professional practice and you cannot maintain your client in this way. You cannot uh, keep him, you will lose him. So if banking operation is based on trust and on respecting uh, clients, then this um, uh, a type of one-off cheating on uh, clients is a long-term loss for a bank. Hello, I just wanted to ask you the National Bank of Serbia, as of this year, practically as of January, only buys foreign currency. No, in January we sold. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, how do you see those developments in the future and appreciation pressures? Uh, are there any seasonal pressures involved? And how do you view the situation until the end of the year, the movements and interventions by the MBS? Just in January only, we sold 180 million, and that's the um, regular seasonal pressure from buying energy and paying obligations uh, from December. What's uh, seasonal pressure this year, and it's being repeated, is the touristic offer, that is the inflow of foreign tourists and the inflow on this account and what we are monitoring, uh, and which is a seasonal movement, is the inflow of remittances. It's somewhat above the expected level. Uh, we are glad to see this. Uh, and this is the inflow of FDI, FDIs, we are on, which are on the rise. And according to our conservative assessment, we expect that they will uh, came at 2.6 uh, billion net inflow by the end of the year, euros, euros. 2.6 billion net euros. 
net inflow. But what we cannot predict are the needs of the purchasers of foreign currency for their production needs, because we do not know uh, in detail the plans, uh, the plans of all the participants in the uh, interbank foreign exchange market. We expected uh, to see the halt in this trend as of mid-year. We expect stagnation. We do not expect uh, pressure in inflow, and we have to. We expect this to uh, move within the uh, our projections. I must tell you one thing related to the first question of Milica dinarization, about dinarization. Uh, there is a problem of uh, euro indexed assets and loans which uh, uh, a bit um, interferes with our projection but that's one of the uh, inherited issues which we inherited from 2002-2006 where this FX clause was treated in an awkward way and this uh, ability to contract your liabilities in uh, FX. Uh, so we have a, a strange uh, two-currency system where the efficiency of the monetary policy and what somebody would call monetary sovereignty is not, uh, was not used to a sufficient extent because this FX indexation um, creates a vague, blurs our picture. So I cannot say with certainty, but we do not expect any significant changes, but we do not also expect uh, to see such a high inflow to continue, uh, partly because the country is reducing its borrowing needs and is trying uh, to, ex uh, to uh, buy FX currency uh, using dinners in order to meet its liabilities, and is being very responsible in this respect, uh, and uh, its liabilities are falling due by the uh, end of the year. And on the other hand, we are not seeing an, any announcement of any significant privatization anytime soon. So we do not have, uh, expect increase in appreciation pressures, but I cannot say by, with certainty. Uh, we, are seeing, we expected this to stop by the six months, but we are seeing uh, more inflow of foreign currency. And who would say that we will have to intervene in order to prevent uh, excessive strengthening of the dinars? Uh, I didn't expect that. But this is the um, answer to those questions. Why is Serbia good? example. You said uh, total net FDI 2.6 uh, billion. We expect by according to the conservative assessment to see by the end of the year 2.6 billion uh, of uh, net inflow of FDI. Do you have any target uh, about the level of the dinar for the end of the year? <laughs> to be honest, maybe somebody believes, somebody else will not believe. But I believe that the data speak for themselves. I always uh, use this word relative stability. The target is to maintain stability where somebody, everybody will be able to plan their operations, their business, their lives, their savings, and their uh, use of uh, goods. And the point where all these participants' uh, interest intersects is uh, this relative stability. We never targeted any level of the dinar. We never announced the, the level of the dinar. There are some projections of the exchange rate, uh, which are used by corporates and by us when we are planning some of our activities. But we are never targeting any level of the exchange rate. And I don't have any expectations as well. I expect it to be stable and, to be, and for the situation to be even better than it was. In the past. Um, we would like to thank you for your attention and for your interest. Although the report is about 2017, we are glad that you're interested in it because uh, from it we derive our tools and future decisions. Thank you very much.